Hello class, welcome to our read aloud. We are currently reading A Week in the Woods by Andrew Clements. I thought it would be fitting to conclude our read aloud of A Week in the Woods by reading In the Woods. I have a very peaceful place here by a nice brook. It's flowing very nicely because of the April rains and the April thaw. So we are going to read the last two chapters today of A Week in the Woods, chapter 21 and 22. I hope you have enjoyed the story. Thank you, Andrew Clements, for writing a wonderful book. Chapter 21, Found. Mr. Maxwell? Mark grabbed his flashlight and trotted toward the voice. Mr. Maxwell, where were you? I tried, I tried to... And then Mark saw him. Mr. Maxwell squinted and turned his face from the glare of the flashlight. Visibly shivering, his hat was gone. His hair was matted down, wet with sweat, with steam rising off his head into the freezing air. His face was pale as a full moon and twisted by pain, his lips purple. It's my ankle, he said, grunting as he took another step. His voice wasn't much louder than a dry whisper. Mark aimed his light down at Mr. Maxwell's boots, and then trained the beam on the right one. A black leather belt had been wrapped five or six times around the outside of the tan hunting boot, and buckled tightly into place. The pant leg above the boot top had been partly torn away, and Mark could see scrapes and a deep bruise on the exposed skin. Moving quickly to his side, Mark grabbed his right arm and said, Hold on! And then helped Mr. Maxwell walk the last ten yards. At the side of the outcropping, Mark said, Sit here. With Mark's help, Mr. Maxwell eased himself down slowly until he was sitting on the ground, his back against the rock. Ten seconds later, Mark said, Lean forward. And when Mr. Maxwell did, Mark wrapped the space blanket around his back and over his shoulders. Then Mark unzipped his sleeping bag and tucked it around him like a blanket, pulling it down to cover his legs as well. Taking off his stocking cap, Mark pulled it onto Mr. Maxwell's head. It was too small to go all the way over his ears. Mark said, A person loses most of his body heat from his head. You said that in class, remember? Mr. Maxwell smiled weakly and nodded. Right. Mark pulled on his jacket and his headlamp, walked over to some fallen trees, and quickly gathered an armload of sticks. Then he looked around the edge of his fire pit until he found the two wads of birch tinder he hadn't used earlier. Using a stick, he stirred the ashes of his campfire to see if there might be a live ember hiding there. Nothing. So Mark pushed the warm ashes to one side, laid the tinder in the center, pulled the striker bar and the hacksaw blade from his jacket pocket, and in 30 seconds had a fire kindled. Twigs, then sticks, then small branches, and then a couple of larger sticks. An occasional gust of wind blew the smoke back toward Mr. Maxwell, but mostly the fire pit was well shielded by the outcropping. Glancing at Mr. Maxwell in the firelight, Mark was scared. He looked awful. Hey, he said, you must be thirsty. Mr. Maxwell nodded, so Mark grabbed the unopened liter bottle from his pack. Here, but make it last, okay? I've only got a little more in the other bottle, but I've got some food. Back in a minute. Mr. Maxwell watched the headlight bob through the darkness as Mark trotted out to his hanging stuff sack, saw him lower it to the ground, and then trot back. He fished into the sack, then holding out one of each, Mark said, Energy bar or Snickers? Mr. Maxwell said, Energy, please. The water must have helped because his voice sounded more normal. Unwrapping the bar for him, Mark said, Okay, but eat slowly, because if you chew it smaller, it gets absorbed faster, right? His mouth already full, Mr. Maxwell nodded. The bar was gone in less than a minute, so Mark said, Better have a Snickers, too. I have five of them. Mixer Maxwell did not refuse. Mark broke up some thicker dead branches, and soon the warmth of the fire was helping to cut the chill. Some color had returned to Mr. Maxwell's cheeks. He looked a little more like a science teacher and a little less like a ghost. Mark said, Is your ankle real bad? Mr. Maxwell tried to smile. Well, it's not good. I'm pretty sure it's broken. Didn't unlace my boot to look. How did it happen? Me being stupid, that's how, said Mr. Maxwell. I tracked you to the place on the loop trail where it goes up to the ridge. Then I saw you went straight. So I figured you were taking a shortcut across, and I wanted to get to the trail before you did. So I didn't track you. 
and went across above you on the mountain, because I was afraid that if I got too close, you'd hear me and hide or run off and really get yourself lost out there. So I got to the trail, and I figured I was above you, so I started hurrying down, which is two mistakes at once, hurrying when I was alone and hurrying downhill. I knew I was tired and dehydrated, and the light was getting bad, but I hurried anyway. Just a lot of stupid stuff all at once and all it took was one stretch of steep trail and one rock that wasn't steady, and one big fat boot coming down too fast and too sloppy. The rock tipped and I went down hard. My foot got wedged, and then another rock fell in on top, a big one. That's the one that hurt me. I couldn't lift it off, and I called out your name four or five times, and then I guess I passed out for a while. It hurt pretty bad. You didn't hear me call back? asked Mark. Because I heard you yell. At first I ran away, downhill and I'm sorry about that. But then I called back. I even blew my whistle and went back uphill looking for you. But I figured you must have headed back down to the camp. I walked east so I get back to the main trail. That's how I ended up here. Mr. Maxwell said, I did hear the whistle, and I yelled my head off, but my throat was too dry and my voice didn't last long. You must have been downwind of me and too far away. Mr. Maxwell shook his head and made a wry face. Besides, I figured maybe you heard me and then lit out to get as far away from me as you could. There was an awkward silence. Mark got up and put two more pieces of wood on the fire. Then he asked, So how'd you get your foot loose? Pure dumb luck, said Mr. Maxwell. That's how. It was almost dark and I was in a lot of pain. But right there, right next to the trail, there were some young maple trees. And I looked at the rock, pinning an my ankle, and I could see that if I had a lever, I could pry it up enough to get my foot out. But deadwood breaks too easily, said Mark. I've been breaking up maple all night for firewood. Who said anything about deadwood? asked Mr. Maxwell. I used a live maple, about eight feet long. You broke off a live tree? Nope, said Mr. Maxwell. Didn't break it. Cut it. With this. Mr. Maxwell stuck his hand out from under the sleeping bag. He was holding the tool. The knife. Oh, said Mark. He felt his face turning red. Here said Mr. Maxwell, tossing it to Mark. Open up the saw. The saw? said Mark. Sure, the saw. Mark turned the tool over in his hands a couple times, then pulled at one of the blades. It was a file. Oops, he said, pushing it back into the handle. I always get the file and the saw mixed up. Mark fiddled some more and then pulled out a blunt, serrated knife blade. On the third try, he found the saw and pulled it out until it clicked all the way open. That's a great little saw, said Mr. Maxwell. Ripped through four inches of green maple tree in about 15 minutes. Then I knocked off the branches, lopped off the top, got a smaller rock to use for a fulcrum, and zip, got myself free in three minutes flat. Nothing like a simple machine. And then later, I smelled wood smoke and started working my way toward it. Figured it had to be you. Nodding at the tool, Mr. Maxwell, Mr. Maxwell said, Better close that up. Sure, said Mark. He pushed at the back of the saw blade. It wouldn't move. Guess it's stuck. You have to unlock it, Mr. Maxwell said. Right, said Mark, but he didn't know where to push to make the blade close. After he'd fiddled with it for about ten seconds, Mr. Maxwell said, Here. He held out his hand and Mark gave him the tool. With a simple motion of his thumb, Mr. Maxwell pushed down the lock catch and snapped the saw blade shut. Mr. Maxwell looked at Mark in the orange firelight and quietly said, Mark. I know it's not your knife. It's got Jason's name scratched on the handle. I went to my truck to tell you I knew, but you weren't there. I wanted to tell you that I understood why you took the blame that way, but you weren't there. And I'm not mad at you for running off. You should have told me the truth, that it wasn't Jason's knife, but I understand why you didn't. I've been pretty nasty, and I'm sorry. This is all my fault, all of it. I'm going to make sure you don't get in trouble, none at all and I hope you can forgive me. Mark's chest felt so tight he could hardly breathe. Mr. Maxwell said, and you don't have to say anything. Better if you don't, so that's that. After the silence had stretched to 20 or 30 seconds, Mr. Maxwell said, say, do you think I could have another Snickers bar? I'm still pretty hungry. Sure. Mark jumped up and got him one. Talking with his mouth full, Mr. Maxwell said, so, how come you got onto the loop trail in the first place? Well, you see, I wanted to get back to the campground before dark, 
I guessed everyone would think I was lost, but I'm not because I've got my compass and Mrs. Farr gave us all a map. But if everyone thought I was lost, then it would turn into a big deal, and that would ruin the whole week for everybody, and I didn't want that. Mr. Maxwell didn't try to talk. It would have been hard for him at that moment, and not just because his mouth was full of candy bar. He'd had this feeling many times during his life as a teacher, only not so much recently. This feeling of quiet awe at the basic decency of people, and especially children, how they understand about right and wrong. He'd seen it so many times, and then he would forget about it, about how if people are given half a chance, they do the right thing. Sitting there, with his ankle throbbing, Mr. Maxwell felt certain he wouldn't forget it again. He was glad for the swirling wood smoke. It gave him a good reason to let his eyes water a little. When he'd finished the Snickers, Mr. Maxwell saw the piece of maple branch on the ground beside Mark's sleeping area. He reached out from under the sleeping bag and picked it up. What's this, Mark? Mark said, that's my bear stick. Oh, said Mr. Maxwell. Right. It's a nice one. Good and sturdy. Mind if I borrow it? Mark looked surprised, but he said, no, you can use it. Good, said Mr. Maxwell, because it looks like a good cane to me. He tossed the sleeping bag to one side and struggled to his feet. I know you've got a couple of flashlights. You say you've got a map and a compass? Right here, said Mark, patting his jacket pocket. Great, said Mr. Maxwell. Then let's get this fire put out and break camp. If we go due east anywhere below Barker Falls, we'll run smack into the main trail. Can't miss it. I'm guessing it's about maybe an hour from here. At my speed, that is. We get to the trail and head down, and by sunup, we'll be almost back at the campground. Probably make it in time for breakfast. First morning, it's always pancakes. Ready to go? Mark was ready. Chapter 22, Home Mr. Maxwell had to stop every 15 minutes or so and rest. He didn't complain once as he limped along, but Mark could tell by the way Mr. Maxwell breathed that each step was painful. It ended up taking them almost four hours to hike down to the campground. By the time they arrived, breakfast was over, but the kitchen crew was happy to fire up the griddle and make a special batch of pancakes for the returning adventurers. The ranger came in as Mark and Mr. Maxwell were having seconds. Bill, am I glad to see you? Reaching out to shake a hand that was sticky with maple syrup, he said, And you must be Mark Chelmsley. Gave us all a scare there for a while. Glad you're both back safe and sound. Mr. Maxwell wiped off his chin. He winked at Mark and said, Jim, this boy and I were a little disappointed that you didn't have a big posse all set to come rescue us. We thought there'd be dogs and helicopters and state police all over the place this morning. It's almost like you didn't care. The ranger smiled. When Mrs. Leghorn came and told me what you told her to, well, as far as I was concerned, that was the end of it. She said you'd found the boy and that you'd bring him back soon. So you know what I did? I sat down and read the paper for a while. Then I went home, ate a nice dinner with my wife, watched some baseball on TV, and went to bed. And look, you're back. Soon, just like you said. Now, I won't say that we weren't all a little concerned, especially early this morning. Mrs. Leghorn came and told me that we had to call the whole program off and get the National Garden here. But I told her that we'd wait and see till about noon. So really, you two got home about three hours early. Looking down at Mr. Maxwell's right leg, he said, What happened? Bear get you? Mr. Maxwell smiled and shook his head. Nope, a rock. The ranger said, Well, if you need someone to drive you over to the clinic in Bushelton, let me know. Then looking at Mark, he said, I'm mighty glad old Bill found you, young feller. Mr. Maxwell shook his head. It didn't happen that way, Jim. We found each other. Ten minutes later, the boy and his teacher stood outside the door of the main lodge. Mr. Maxwell said, I've got to go get this ankle looked at. Think you can find your way back to the raven's nest without getting lost? Mark grinned. Can do. Okay, then. See you later. Mr. Maxwell turned and took a step, then quickly turned back. Oh, almost forgot. He reached into his pocket and took out the knife. Holding it up, he said, Tell Jason that I'll keep this for him until the end of the week, okay? And tell him that I'm going to have to have a little talk with him about obeying rules. Mark said, I'll tell him. Thanks, Mr. Maxwell. And Mr. Maxwell smiled and said, Thank you, Mark. When the orange buses rocked to a halt in the school driveway late Friday afternoon, a friendly mob of grown-ups was waiting. Every child stepped down into a cheerful flurry of hugs and hellos. Even some of the boys who thought they didn't want to be hugged and kissed put up with it. 
It had only been a week, but it had seemed much longer. Mark, over here! Mark turned and saw Leon waving at him. Then Anya got out of the car and started waving too. Mark ran down the driveway and gave them each a hug. Anya kissed him on the cheek. It is too quiet with only Leon around the house. I am so glad you are home. Me too, said Mark. As Leon put the frame pack into the truck, he asked, You had a good time? It was great. We did some hiking, and we stayed up late one night and looked at the stars through telescopes. And I saw an eagle and some bear tracks. It was great. Mark got in the back seat, and while they waited for the cars ahead of them to move, he leaned forward and kept talking. Yeah, and on the third day, the guys in my cabin got to help the ranger check for missing trail markers, and he said that we... There was a knock on Leon's window. Leon lowered it, and Mr. Maxwell said, Mr. Lamentov, I'm Bill Maxwell, Mark's science teacher. We talked for a couple of minutes on Monday afternoon, and I wanted to let you know I was sorry if my call worried you. I know the ranger called a little later to explain the situation, but I wanted to thank you myself for being so understanding. Leon shook the hand that Mr. Maxwell offered and said, Of course, Mr. Maxwell. This is my wife, Anya. We are glad to meet you. We have heard of you often from Mark, and he's just telling us how he had such good fun. Mr. Maxwell smiled broadly and said, Best week ever. Then bending down so he could look into the back seat, he said, Mark, this is for you. And Mr. Maxwell handed him the knife in its leather sheath. Mark looked confused. But, Jason... Mr. Maxwell shook his head. Jason wouldn't take it. He said it was yours now. So I guess it is. Well, I've got to run. Nice to meet you, folks. And with that, Mr. Maxwell turned and went back toward the buses, the cast in his right foot making him sway from side to side as he walked. Mark lowered his window and leaned out. Mr. Maxwell? He called. Mr. Maxwell stopped and turned around. I... I'll see you on Monday. Mr. Maxwell smiled and nodded. You bet, Mark. See you Monday. As Anya opened the door from the garage to the kitchen, the phone was ringing. She answered it and then called. Mark, it's for you. It's your father. Hello? Mark, good to hear your voice, son. We knew you'd be getting home about now. Heard from Anya about the business on your camping trip. Everything work out all right? Yep, said Mark. It all worked out fine. His mom joined the conversation, and she said, But you were lost on a mountain all night? All by yourself? Is that right? Well, not all night, said Mark. And I wasn't really lost. I had a compass and everything. It was just too hard to hike in the dark. And I got tired, too. I'll tell you the whole story when you get home. That'll be sooner than you think, said his dad. Your mom got worried, so we hopped on the Concord this morning and flew into New York three hours ago. You were worried too, Robert, said his mother. Well, sure. I was worried too, I admit it. So anyway, Mark, we're going to spend the night here in Scarsdale and drive up tomorrow. Be there about lunchtime. Great, said Mark, because I want to talk about something with both of you. You bet, said his dad. We'll talk, we'll do a little hiking, maybe drive up to Hanover. It'll be a great weekend. Talk about what, said his mom, and Mark could hear the concern in her voice. Mark hesitated, then took a deep breath and said, I want to talk about maybe staying here, like going to school in Whitson next year, because it's got a good accelerated program at the middle school. My friend Jason says so. And Jason's big brother? He went to school here, and he just got accepted into Princeton. So the schools aren't bad. They couldn't be. And, and that's what I want to talk about. There was a long silence on the line. His mom spoke first. Well, I thought we had this all worked out, Mark. About next year in Runyon Academy? And really, I think that... His dad broke in. Mark? Absolutely. If you want to talk about it, we'll talk. That whole Runyon thing? That's not written in stone. So tomorrow you and your mom and me will all sit down and talk about it. That sound right to you, Lo? Mark heard the tiniest hesitation, but his mom said... Of course, yes, we'll talk about it, because all we want is what's best for you, Mark. That's all we want. The conversation seemed to have hit a stone wall. Then Mark's dad said, I was putting a coat in the closet here, Mark, and I saw some of your stuff, your lacrosse stick and some soccer balls, sports stuff mostly. You want me to toss anything in the car before we come tomorrow? Yeah, that'd be great. Bring the stick and both of the balls and my soccer shoes, too. I think they'll still fit. Mark's mom said, Mark. I'll hang up now. See you tomorrow. I love you, dear. Love you too, Mom. After the click, his dad said, So, anything else I should bring? 
can't think of anything, said Mark. Then, wait, where are you now, Dad? In my office on the second floor. Could you go down the hall to my old bedroom? Asked Mark. Sure, hold on a sec. Mark heard the casters of the desk chair, then footsteps, and he could picture his dad going out of his doorway, then turning left and walking beside the curving banister to the third door on the left, Mark's old room. Here I am, Mark, but there's nothing here, remember? You clean the place out. Okay, said Mark. Now go over to the radiator by the window. The radiator? What for? asked his dad. Are you there? said Mark. Yep, listen. And Mark heard a clank as his dad tapped the phone against the metal. Good, said Mark. Now tip the radiator back toward the wall a little and look under the right front leg. Do you see it? Wait, said his dad. Mark heard a soft grunt of effort and then, a penny? You're having me do all this for a penny. Do you have it? asked Mark. Yes, I've got it, said his dad. Great, you can bring it with you tomorrow, okay, dad? And don't get it mixed up with your other change, okay? I want that penny. I get it, said his dad. This is a lucky penny, right? Mark said, yeah, sort of. Haven't I always told you there's no such thing as luck? And as he said that, Mark could picture the look in his dad's face. I know that, said Mark. It's, it's just a penny, Dad. I left it there when we moved, and now I want to have it up here in New Hampshire, that's all. A quick moment passed, and his dad said, sure, I understand, Mark. I'll keep this safe for you. Thanks. No problem. His dad was quiet for a second or two, and then he said, so? I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Okay, Dad. And then his dad said, I'm proud of you, son. His dad had said those words to him before, probably dozens of times. But as Mark heard them this time, the words sounded different, and they felt different. Everything felt different. Mark drew in a deep breath, and he swallowed hard, and he blinked his eyes a few times. Then he smiled and said, Thanks, Dad. See you tomorrow. And that is the end of our Read Aloud, A Week in the Woods by Andrew Clements. Well, I hope you really enjoyed it. I certainly did. Thank you again to author Andrew Clements for writing such a wonderful book. Make a great day, everyone.